So hey, let's start. January and next time we'll open in Berlin in one month or so. Um, today we have gathered in order to give a, a curatorial a guide uh, for this exhibition. Uh, if you have some questions anytime, just let know and ask and we can discuss. Just I would like to make uh, some kind of a concrete start for the tour. And I would start it. Um, basically on a very humane level, on a personal level, when I, uh, when I got acquainted with this uh, Lapland artist community and when I was invited to Lapland for a uh, curatorial visit, uh, to visit uh, the artists and their studios and to start building a plan for the exhibition concept. Uh, I went to Lapland with this kind of attitude that I'm going to Finland. Finland is Finland, you know, and I'm going to a neighboring country, a western country. Um, and okay, yes, it's probably different, it's the Laponian region and, and the histories, the uh, differences within the uh, local uh, life and the population, you know, so in a historical sense, I knew those things. And um, when I basically um, met Lapland people and the places, I kind of started to notice uh, certain issues that the different people are related with. And I perceived it very uh, personally again, because they were very general and very humanistic uh, problems that people were working on, or not even working, but living certain things through. So that was a certain kind of struggle that at first appeared to me as uh, this kind of energy, this kind of uh, uh, libido, sexual energy of, of a human being and it's uh, opposite, that's something that is, that is blocking this energy. Uh, then it suddenly it uh, started to appear to me that of course it is through um, certain kind of physical conditions that are present, but the physical condition is not uh, characteristic only to Lapland, it is, it is, it is what I know, uh, it, it is what, what many people know everywhere basically. They are pretty universal issues. For some reason they were extremely um, explicit there in their works. So um, I'm now standing on the, uh, on, on the uh, background of uh, Elina Sipila's work, 24 hours. So this is maybe this kind of an opening, opening work of, of uh, this kind of reality or this kind of struggle or, or the condition where uh, people live. So um, basically it appears to us as an installation and you can uh, make a lot of parallels with uh, many uh, works out of art history of the West as we know it. Uh, it has some kind of connotations to uh, among artists, conceptual art, it has this kind of geometrical shapes, and it has this logic of repetition. But in the same time, it means 24 hours. Each hour is recorded. Each hour is recorded in this very formal, uh, almost a, a four format. And, and we see basically the darkness, the, the blackness, and during the polar night period, and then a little bit of piece of landscape out there, and then this all again. So it is extremely realistic, realistic and honest work without this kind of artificiality of art, without this kind of, um, I'd say, excessive, uh, excessive meaning and heavy disturbance by art history that is very often, I think, haunting artists in Estonia and in Central Europe. Uh, I see some kind of very honest presence and very honest embodiment in, in, in um, all Laponian artists who are here. So, and um, 
this kind of physical condition appeared to me as this kind of um, personal struggle, which we see from Anse Anhela's works. So he's a, he's a very, uh, very fruitful uh, painter. He has a lot of works, and I know that Tartu already has some kind of fan club for his works. People I heard were waiting for you know, to see this stuff, and the more, the more the better. And downstairs there is also another work. So basically, you can you can see, and, and I can say that um, it is the character of this artist, or, or, or this kind of. Uh, the identity of this artist is extremely present in these works. I happened to meet with him, okay, it was like maybe like a bit more than one hour, but it was, it was a great intuitively, great uh, recognition that, that uh, his work is so much related with the person. So you can, you can basically see the um, conflict, the, the internal struggle, this kind of dark energy, Libido is very often related in his works, but uh, it's always in the condition of oppression. But oppression is not only this kind of uh, inevitable physical darkness, but the oppression is social, you can see basically this. And there is one word about those who, who are not from Lapland, but they are the incomers, and it's uh, related with railway, how it is. Juhan Tuoma. Yeah. So you, you, can, you can sense that there is a vocabulary for those who are not from Lapland. That means that actually this community is pretty much, uh, uh, can be very rejective to those who are incomers. And also between those who live there, as I have understood, there is a Sami community who has their own autonomous uh, region, their own artistic uh, institutions, Sami uh, artist union, yes, and there is Lapland, who are also, let's say, indigenous because they live there and they were born there for generations. They've been living there, so there is many, many kind of uh, confusive elements in this community. And then you can see basically the kind of the globalist sense in his works that. It's not only personal, it's, it's, it's very often related with this, let's say, this global capitalism. You see that they always come from overseas with the aircraft, and the, what they do is they basically they shit everywhere, and you have to deal. You are full of anger, and then you are, in a way, you are also handless. You cannot do it in a way, basically. Yeah, and then when we look downstairs, there is one work made by uh, Mark Roberts and Mina Rainio. It's a video about a factory that was in Lapland and that was shut down in 2003 uh, because it was cheaper to produce stuff in China. So these artists filmed this factory, they, they were talking with some local people who were related with it and some Chinese music was put uh, as a voiceover over the uh, Laponian landscapes. So this is kind of the effect that Lapland is actually, yes it lies within a Western country, world's uh, almost number one welfare society, but in the same time, uh, this kind of the West has its own peripheric regions. We know, like uh, Portugal is actually the wet, most Western part of Europe, which is a periphery in a way now, due to global capitalist proceedings. And then Lapland is also this kind of place that is inhabited by the locals, but the main interest. Uh, for the global capital is only the natural resources and there is um, there is uh, again uh, again uh, has uh, come some kind of struggle resistance against this there is one uh, group called Sopan Terror if you have heard they are uh, Sami activist artists who who with the visual art and and uh, I believe also some kind of uh, participation in, in, in society proceedings, they are making interventions in this region to, to stop the expansion of, of uh, exploitation of land and, and, and people and, and resources. So this is, this is somehow opens this context that there are really dark energies included, people are struggling, there is a physical uh, condition, geographic condition of Arctic Pole. and. Uh, 
And there is also a confrontation to this. Confrontation that can be basically what do you do? One thing is autoaggression. The other thing is the aggression that goes outside of you. Or if it's not the aggression, then it's some kind of a therapy. And we have actually in this, uh, in this exhibition, we have uh, pretty much work that works that, that appears as a self-therapy uh, for artists. Okay, therapy is too clinical maybe word to use, but uh, some kind of um, uh, uh, fruitful process that is, uh, that is uh, uh, saying yes to life and fluidly, not getting stuck with, with your black energy, with your blocked libido, with your blocked hopes, uh, uh, this kind of living uh, uh, energy. So in metaphorical sense it compares in, in, in different works. So here we see uh, uh, for example, Marco Hegel has a photo series that's also on, on the front page of the uh, catalog. That he installed uh, some uh, neon lights uh, with the dark forest that is situated between uh, Finland and Sweden in the border area. There is a torn in the river. And he said that this uh, part uh, was pretty much populated. And there were sheep, cattle, people who were keeping their farms and, and homes there, but due to the globalization and many other proceedings in, in this Sweden and, and uh, Finland, this region has also peripherized that people have left. So there is a lot of like uh, houses that are basically empty and a lot of land that is not used and there is this kind of uh, uh, lack of light in this social sense. So he installed this kind of social light, which we know from, from the interior of, of uh, houses and offices and homes, to the forest. And it somehow uh, um, kind of uh, re refers to this kind of solitude. Uh, solitude within the darkness. And, and uh, really like um, the... the, the um, the darkness is so massive that the light somehow is limited to itself, to the object only. It's like a glowing object. And it, it, it maybe happens to enlighten something around it, but uh, actually it is more just a shape and that's the end of it. So an, another condition uh, which is presented here. So. Um, Darkness and light. Uh, in the catalog text, I have written about uh, this kind of uh, vocabulary that I've been using because I have included this kind of metaphorical play with uh, what is darkness, what is light, what, what we know about those things. And our knowledge about darkness and light has a very precise history and very precise um, infrastructure of this knowledge that. What we know as light, light is something positive, light is um, something uh, um, basically which has been characterized by culture and humanity which has in this uh, planet has always been for some reason presented by Europe and the white culture. We know what Goethe said when he was dying, his last words were, were more light and um, and it, of course it leads to enlightenment. The era of enlightenment, this concept that light is something to get rid of confusion, get rid of uh, the uncontrollable, and darkness is the rest. So light is Europe, or the West, as it said, and the rest is dark and black. So these, these connotations are present because we are also facing here global capitalism, which is the result of actually this kind of uh, understanding of the struggle between light and dark. So, um, science and knowledge itself has been this kind of um, project of this kind of Eurocentricism, modernity, that uh, considers light as everything that we understand and we can control, let's say text, we can control everything with the text, and science is only based on text. If you don't have basically scientific knowledge, 
you know, the, then uh, everything is considered as subjective, uh, you know, like not trustworthy and anything. And, but scientific knowledge always appears as a very certain kind of text with references, with authority, with institution behind it. So there, in this room, there is one metaphor for this. It is the... Um, It's the installations of uh, Sauli Miettunen. We can see the uh, scientific method that he basically um, that he uh, reuses um, to expose some kind of uh, creatures. From the dark, we can see this kind of a butterfly. We can see uh, fish. We can we can see some uh, something that the artist calls a soldier, but uh, some unknown uh, species. Basically, it's about species because we are used that all the species have been registered. It was Carl Linné from Sweden who invented this kind of system that. All the living beings on this planet can be registered, they can be systematized, of course, among those living beings. Beings were humans who were divided into races. And many uh, philosophers from the West, Western Enlightenment, uh, were very active in, in, uh, in organizing the whole planet into races. Uh, it is said about Immanuel Kant that uh, this guy never left Königsberg town in his lifetime, but he racialized the whole planet. <laughs> and it is true. All these thick books, all these kind of uh, um, killed butterflies systematically presented, and also we know uh, uh, when we go to Lapland we see a lot of uh, skulls. Uh, human skulls uh, used in uh, artist works and I was wondering where does it come from is it just kind of this, the same cliche that oh in Norwegia uh, 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 they have in, in Norway they have so much black metal bands maybe it's some kind of you know this cultural uh, you know hip uh, black metal fetish but it has a historical reference because in in the uh, first part of 20th century in Finland and in Sweden and in Norway they were still uh, measuring the skulls of uh, Sami people, and and uh, well, in, in, with the same scientific uh, uh, sense, with the same scientific attitude that it should be controlled and all the knowledge and all uh, measurements are so trustworthy, and it's the uh, enlightenment, you know, that the scientist can do anything and control and produce knowledge, and others read it from thick books and then racialize again. Um, but uh, knowledge, uh, knowledge is something that is related with authority. So uh, basically this is the metaphor of, of this reference of uh, getting control into the uncontrollable or if even not control but just to expose something out of uh, confusion or, or out of maybe whatever, you even if we call it nothingness. But the same mm, mm, method of how to understand actually culture, how to mm, understand the foreign culture that has been in the same way researched by scientists. Is, it, this is uh, performed by uh, Johannes Tuominen, who has for tens of years, as I understood, uh, been focused on, uh, on the Buts and Sea culture. And, uh, and especially the uh, grey tombs of uh, Ottoman era presented in Turkey, in different uh, places in Turkey. And he has used, um, let's say, the language of art and the language of, of modernist uh, avant-garde uh, in, in the sense of using uh, methods of artistic translation and, and uh, let's say, visible figures to organize, uh, uh, to organize knowledge and to organize the materials and content in order 
uh, uh, to make it understandable and not even understandable but also like um, as, an, as a human experience and part of subjectivity. Uh, so these works we can see, we have also artist Johanny Tuominen present here, maybe who would like to add something, maybe he disagreed with me. <laughs> okay. If you have some questions, you can ask him. And then we have also uh, connotations to um, modernist avant-garde art um, with these two pieces by Maria Pignon. Here, um, I have my own theories, but maybe Maria would speak instead of. Yes, the first theory. <laughs> Well, I perceive this as this um, game uh, with, um, or not a game, but a metaphor to, to uh, contemporary art as itself. That contemporary art is known as to be based on, on avant-garde art. And the foundation of avant-garde art piece is, uh, it, it's not the piece exactly, this black square by Kashimir Malevich, I think it has been considered the entire uh, exhibition, the last futurist uh, show, as it was in 1914 in, in Petersburg, this, this exhibition has been officially considered as the foundation of contemporary art. So I see this kind of reference in, in the shapes and, and the figures that you use, that uh, this kind of uh, refers to pixel, pixels and, and uh, that kind of visibility that can be compressed into pixels and they slightly disappear into this Kashimir uh, Malevich black square. This is how I understand this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> That's uh, the nice thing in art that you can understand it so many, many ways. And uh, I can tell a little bit background how I made these two uh, artwork. It was last summer when I was in uh, Kemijärvi Artist Residency in Finnish Lapland and during the residency period I made Silent Threat Read uh, and uh, I made both of these artworks during this Threat Read. The uh, name of this artwork is uh, Xeniteja and this is Awakening. Um, Xeniteja is Greek word and it means uh, voluntary exile from uh, home country when you leave all, all uh, materialistic and uh, social and also spiritual things back and something new is coming. It's also about finding your own part and about unknown which is waiting for you. So, do we combine this? <laughs> That's a, yes, I understand your. I can, I can maybe now. I would like to now ask that. Do you also maybe with also Johan? You consider uh, the way of um, being based on um, this kind of contemporary art and modernist uh, avant-garde art. Is it also some kind of a being in exile in Laponia and in, in the Lapland context, while you could also uh, do something, let's say, traditional? traditional painting, which could be more or is very often related with the location, although it doesn't have to be related. Yeah, I, I, I'm not originally from Lapland, I have just lived there now more or less five years, and I feel that in Lapland there is uh, peace and uh, silence and quietness and space to do art, and also of course to live. So at least I moved to Lapland from Madrid, from Spain, so at least for me, maybe it's some kind of exile <laughs> mm -hmm. to live there, and I like like that that it's different environment. Because the uh, uh, oldest artist of uh, this exhibition is Eero Kumpula. His work is presented downstairs. It's a painting, and uh, when I met with him, uh, uh, going to his uh, studio and home was like um, some kind of a journey to a shaman, basically. That you're driving along the road in Lapland, an empty landscape, and suddenly there is an official road sign which uh, points at this is artist's studio there. 
So you go to the forest, go to the studio, and it is somehow like a, basically a going to a shaman, a, a, a person who has been working on a very local content and who himself, when I met with him, said that uh, you can paint Lapland landscapes only when you are from Lapland. So, uh, uh, relation with uh, uh, artist and the location appeared through him and his, uh, basically what he said to me, that, he, that is his aspect uh, that he, he uh, likes to use for self-conceptualization. In the same time, we, we have artists from elsewhere who are living in Lapland and who are completely uh, not willing to relate themselves with this kind of local stigmatization because very often Lapland artists are stigmatized that, aha, you are from there. It, it is also with East European artists and it is also actually with artists from the former third worlds that it's also a well-known fact that in USA they have science in, in Europe they have uh, knowledge and in the rest of the world there is only culture. So, very often uh, uh, Lapland and, and, and places like this uh, uh, can only uh, be exposed in the center of course, in the hegemonic sense, they can only be ex exposed through this kind of exotic otherness, this, this kind of element that, that uh, says, yeah, we are different, we are from there, we have nothing else to say except that we are from there. So many artists um, mm, mm, uh, somehow also try to confront this. And in the sense that some may feel not to be included in Lapland community, I guess they, they consider their work as some sort of exile. Mm. I think because you can be yourself wherever you are, and the, where, what you do, what you work with, is the embodiment who you are. And I think this is important. And it's also one way of survival, in, in mental survival, in, in, uh, mm. anywhere you live. But the other piece is also by you, Maria. Can you? Well, well, yes, yes, I agree. I made it in Kenya, and uh, it's quite different, actually. I made this at first, and this was the second piece. And, uh, it tells a story about uh, the moment when you wake up and uh, something has changed in your life and there is no return to old, old kind of life or old kind of moments. What did you think? <laughs> uh, I, I see there is some kind of um, fluidity mm -hmm. present visually. And yes, yeah, separation, uh, but also like being in circulation, not being stuck, but being in, in a stream. Yes, and connection, I would say. Separation, but yes. at the same time, connection. Yes, yes, connection. exactly, yes. And this, in, in that sense of spiritual sense, it um, refers to uh, humanity and, and the balance of, of this energy, this light and dark. This is somehow what, what, what people have been. Uh, dealing with in their private lives or anyhow in their lives to, to keep the balance and to uh, you know like uh, like Ansi's painting yes it's, it's one thing is you, you get stuck and you have a knife in your hand and it doesn't lead you anywhere in the same time um, years pass and pass so uh, uh, as Nini, Kor uh, Nini and Thomas Korkol downstairs in the lobby, there is one video. They say in their video uh, at a particular place, at a particular time, in the name of the video, they say that each uh, species uh, 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 in some moment in their lives are struggling for their existence. So it, it comes as a sinusoid. That's a sort of sense. And I'd like to also show you. This work This is a painting installation by Esa Melthaus. And basically they are very dynamic works. If you if you're standing 
even in the middle or trying to relate your body with those images or those uh, um, objects and you see the shadow and and you also see how, how the colors are glowing in this work and if you would have less light in this space you would see how this work is almost three-dimensional so this sort of uh, refers to this kind of metaphor water and stones yeah? and downstairs we will uh, speak with uh, Pirko Michael Hapalina who has an installation and who, who is uh, uh, painting mostly water for long years and also the stones and, and this kind of stream fluidity and the uh, uh, kind of uh, stuckness and this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, this kind of balanced circulation that uh, water bodies, especially the rivers, can represent. So, uh, he's a very interesting artist and, and uh, describing him uh, would describe actually, I think all of London artists who I know, that I went to his studio and uh, he, uh, he is a big fisherman like, like many artists in Lapland and he likes to uh, make his own fishing equipment so he is painting the fishing lures with neon colors and, and uh, does all kind of uh, um, organizing and, and source his own equipment so his studio was full of fishing equipment and painting these lures and then he uh, brought out some works and it turned out that he used the same paint as fishing equipment in his, in his paintings. So when he brought out the paintings, the whole uh, studio was like one big installation. There were like a lot of lures on the, on the tables, a lot of fishing rods with the same colors and then, then the pictures. So, so uh, people are uh, mm, really, uh, I think we should learn in Estonia and then that's where we should learn from, uh, uh, from Lapland artists especially like people like Eza, that uh, to be really uh, embodied and related with what you do. So it, it, uh, art should not be artificial and should not be too much related with uh, this kind of art historical knowledge that, uh, that uh, influences us through the authority of education institutions and uh, through the authority of publishers of books and translators of books and powerful persons. But it, it should be, uh, this is the task of education, to um, make the knowledge uh, as experience and embodiment. And uh, I, I think this is... why he teaches at the University of Portland. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and he teaches in the, in, in the university, and you are also teaching. Yes, he's a very good friend of Yes. Tom uh, Enplom, his work is... And his, his installation, you can see here, and it's called Light Barricade. Through the history of the woodworking, it's uh, all, all, 
or the time I'm going on. You can twist the wood in you know, making knots or something if you want nowadays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can twist the wood and make a knot if you want. Mm -hmm. But uh, in later times it was not possible. But nowadays it is. But do you have some logic of uh, representing and uh, design, let's say? Some logic that you use the light and the shape and... Uh, and uh, I quite many times use the light because the, I, I feel that as an artist that uh, when focusing on space, the light is the point where you look at. It's a place of interest as the movement. It's a place of interest that uh, you can use. It is very powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so light barricade, barricade means already like confrontation or something? I feel like I can uh, question about barricades. Yeah. Usually, do we have a reason to call it barricades? Because they are very Light fragile. barricades is uh, not heavy. Because it's very <laughs> fragile also. It can yeah, break very, very easily. Fragile. It can break. Yeah. Yeah. It's a question of uh, do we have a reason Go to barricades. Do we have things to well? Do we? How are we? Uh, do we enjoy our, our lives, or is it darkness? It's not darkness. <laughs> you use it's electricity. A, it's a life that we use, and it's a, we are part of it. And electricity as well. It's dependency from um, the system. Light is in. Dependent on, on electricity. Of course, <laughs> yes. I use a lot of yes. it. Yes. <laughs> okay, and we uh, we go on uh, to Irina Havasta. Irina Havastupola. And she has a series of uh, uh, small paintings. And uh, basically, basically, uh, she is uh, uh, she is related with art education, and uh, her works are somehow appear as a certain kind of uh, also like a light barricade without electricity. Let's say that it's uh, uh, there is one work. When I am sad, I buy myself flowers. So I think this is her uh, somehow quite very good. And her works in general are very like full of full of uh, light, and, uh, and uh, for some reason there are these kind of landscape motifs. So landscape is uh, so much present actually in this in this exhibition. Uh, um, and therefore, it is actually something to something special to point out actually in this and to think about what, what is the, uh, uh, what symptom is landscape. Maybe landscape is symptomatic to some, because it, it, it can reflect very well a certain kind of physical condition and to, to make some kind of, um, like, a, like a statement about what surrounds you or what is your view, what is your gaze. What do you see and what do you experience? But there are many, many cases also uh, in landscape appears as what you would like to experience, what is missing. So I think in, in her works there is this kind of uh, light without electricity that comes from the inside and this is something that is looking for reference in the outside. So it, it is somehow like the communication in a very abstract way. And the same is, is with, I think, uh, Helena Juntila's works. One of them we see up there. She is um, uh, an artist who uh, is uh, very well known for her uh, repeating, um, uh, repeating motifs of uh, a woman and a bear. So it, it is a Nordic, uh, Nordic legend about uh, women getting married uh, with beers and having some kind of relations. I myself don't know much about this. Maybe some of you could explain the story behind women and beers. 
how it can be seen as some kind of um, way of coping uh, with, with some kind of in, inter, internal uh, searching or internal solitude or it is uh, generally some kind of fictional stuff coming from culture. Anyways, uh, her works appear very often like um, in a very powerful way that that uh, in Johan's one, in this exhibition, uh, I also decided to, to expose her more or less as an installation, not just a painting, but, but something that relates with the empty space around it. Yeah. So it, it's like a massive ice, ice uh, fields or, or uh, fields of uh, gallery, uh, empty gallery space. But um, here appears some kind of um, the similar issue that when I'm sad I buy myself flowers mm, in, in that sense that even if it is a legend or something coming from the written culture uh, it, is, uh, it is still a personal issue because the artist is working for years on this content and it's again this kind of uh, everyday life, everyday embodiment and uh, 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 one artist who uses uh, um, avant art language is Riccardo uh, Isco, and he always uh, uh, reveals his work for each of the exhibition. It is uh, uh, set up by different works, each of them has a name, it's all written there, and it comes from uh, his personal life going back in years. And it has different uh, phases and episodes. I hope each one of you can uh, understand basically what it is about. Um, when I visited uh, Lockdown for the first time, then uh, I myself, I, I remember the one exhibition where I went. I really remember this work. It's, it's lovely. Yes. It, it's again related with this being stuck and, and, and the fluidity, the potential for fluidity because there is water inside and we will continue talking about this when we go downstairs and then, then to finish with this upstairs uh, we take this room we have uh, Oti Pieski who is uh, uh, who is uh, who lives in, in the uh, northern part of Lapland, near the Norwegian border, where the Sami community is. She is the only Sami artist in this exhibition. She is uh, very well known. She is now nominated to Ars Femica. And actually the way how she works is extremely traditional and very, very local and in the same time absolutely contemporary it's completely contemporary art and thereby well she is present in this kind of um, selection of, of, of uh, Finnish contemporary art and, um, and you can see basically the installation and the painting as a separate pieces but you can get the uh, idea when you walk through the installation slowly and, and approach the painting. Yeah. And in the other side we see John Port, who is uh, from the United Kingdom originally, but lives in Lapland. And uh, he is, uh, his work is based on text a lot. He works uh, with the text in a very experimental way. The cause is that uh, he is dyslexic, so he cannot read. So when I was first talking about scientific knowledge that often appears to us uh, through text, very well organized text, and this is the light, and then enlightenment, and then this kind of uh, a uh, pure bright mind of humanity, then for some people the same text is as uh, same confusive as uh, any kind of darkness or, or chaotic mass. So for him, 
text is like an unknown forest or darkness. And the only way how to deal with text is just to write this himself, to write instead of reading. And then this is what he's been doing. And then basically the text, you can see, it uh, becomes as an embodiment. It is the experience of certain kind of um, struggle that we can see on the paper. And it, it, it becomes uh, extremely graphic and, and visual. And I think um, his relation is very obvious with, with Johan Tuominen's position and then Sauli Mietunen's position actually. And then also, as I put it, also Maria Brignon's and then Kari Tuiskus position who are using this kind of organized organized uh, 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 elements of uh, avant-gardist art in order to speak about something else, the language of art. Then let's go downstairs. So here we are standing in uh, front of Pirko uh, Mäkel Hapalin uh, installation. And uh, this leads us back to the uh, issues of community and co coexistence within one community. And uh, this is something that I did not speak about before, but I have written in the uh, catalogue of the exhibition that actually making a group exhibition that should reflect uh, the organization but not just organization, but people who belong to organization, but not all people, because there has to be some selection and limitation. So to organize this, uh, uh, it, it should be uh, also approached as a community. How are people in Lapland Artists Association, how, how, what is the basis of selection, and what is the basis that who can speak on behalf of, of Lapland, when there is only few people to be selected out of many. So, uh, uh, the idea was uh, to ask, basically to ask for a contribution in public so that people could propose their ideas if they want to contribute uh, into this topic that appeared to me through certain artists' works when I visited them. So, uh, th this was the idea and later came the uh, direct contributions so I was, uh, I was conceptualizing this uh, selection of artists as coexistence, but not through similarity that something unites those artists. No, it's not necessary at all. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, the coexistence of a difference, where difference is celebrated instead of homogenized into similarity. So. Uh, uh, the community issues you can see in Mark Roberts' video about the factory of the world, about uh, uh, the uh, social situation, the economic uh, situation, the global references. Uh, in Hansi Hanhala's works we saw as this kind of response to this from a single person, as uh, unconstructive, destructive, auto-aggressive response. And uh, here we see Kalle Lampela's uh, collages which, uh, which are extremely social, but they have very uh, precise uh, background because they are based on uh, the uh, magazines of the DDR, uh, Eastern Germany, in the uh, socialist times. And he has used, uh, used these images uh, and exposed them as collage in order to somehow manifest it uh, uh, the state of mind of a pro progressive ideology, the ideology that is based on progress, uh, constant growth, uh, in, not in a positive way, but in, in uh, which started with industrialization before this environment. And growth that was not based on capitalist world order, but that was based on this Cold War era, where the world was divided by two major powers, of the socialist and the so this is, uh, uh, again, uh, some uh, very um, globalistic but also historical background in this content that is present here. 
and and uh, this is the the whole influence on on, on humans that um, that everybody has to cope with. So the in that sense, uh, what we have the most intensively present is this kind of social darkness uh, instead of physical darkness, because physical darkness is let's say inevitable. It is it is the condition where you live on this planet, if you live in the north or you live in the south. And uh, um, this kind of social context and how each of us is dealing with this, it's good way and a bad way, as a sense, or, or, or this kind of dark way and a light way. And, and in, in one sense, I perceive darkness as a negative energy that we saw in Anse Anhala's painting. And the final work, I think, of him in this exhibition is this, basically, that would characterize this kind of uh, response quite well. It's the name of it is spirit. So basically, it gives us some hope because you are basically killing your spirit as I perceive this. And there is something that can even escape from the spirit. As it said that when you die, the spirit escapes your body. What if the spirit is something that you can kill? What if the spirit is also materialized? Uh, is there any kind of way out from this materialization and I think this says yes and this, this, this goes much further from this kind of uh, cultural understanding of human life and death and, and, and light and darkness it, it, it goes beyond it, it goes I think to the to this kind of context that we have used to organize as or to understand as nature and I think uh, now that we see this he, this artist uh, Ero Humpula, who is this traditionalist landscape painter, it's the in the, his naivistic mode he is he is saying that this is the death of the winter, just the, like the simple yes uh, about uh, the physical darkness that is always related with social darkness somehow, as it gives the pressure. And there you can see the escape in some kind of um, mythical sense. So basically, these two energies, fluidity and stuckness, Pirko Mekala is uh, working with water a lot, and maybe Pirko can give some comments about the rules. Yeah, and about this, uh, this setting, because uh, the factory here is the factory there. <laughs> I mean, that is in my, in my town. I don't know, Tanel, if you knew the, the connection, but, yeah, but, it, yeah, but it, it, it works. So, if you live in, in uh, big cities, you, you don't have to know the people that you don't want to know. <laughs> you have the freedom of, of choice. So this is, uh, it is a picture of the village where I live. And it could be a picture of a, whatever, uh, this kind of a community where, where you are, you are not choosing the ones that you live with like monasteries, for example, <laughs> and uh, we have here the, the picture of, of lifestyle there. And I'm, through this exhibition that I am one of the artists, I, I found myself linked into the, to the place where I live in a, in a new way. So, I was thinking about when, when we wrote letters with, with Tanel about the darkness and, and light. And for example, there is a, these houses are, are all individual. They have individual characters. So for example, this one is twisted crows. It has a silver pole that you would think that something beautiful would come out of it, but no, there's just a, something else like oh, bitterness or alcoholism or whatever. 
One moment. I yeah. want to comment that yeah. uh, remember the uh, two uh, painting installations upstairs with this water, basement house, with this colorful. One of them was named growth. So there you can, the, the green yeah. one, you can see the organic natural growth of, yeah. let's say, water lilies yeah. that is popping up from the water. Yeah. And this is kind of this kind of civilization and destructive yeah. understanding yes. of growth. Yes, yes, yes it is. And then this is, uh, this is called the, the, the house of believers, the house of prayer. Uh, we have a sect in northern Finland, Lapland. It is a sect in, inside the Lutheran church that is called uh, the Lestadius movement. And they, they believe that they are the only ones. <laughs> they are the chosen ones. They are the only ones to have the keys of heaven. So that is why they are, their house is so narrow and <laughs> so high and it only one stairs. <laughs> and then this, uh, this is called Diligent Martha. I don't know if you are acquainted with the story in Bible of Maria and Martha, where Maria is this kind of a meditative person, and, and Martha is uh, working, working, working. And she's, she's quite uh, control. <laughs> she wants to have control over, over the house, over the family, over the generations with her diligent work, so that's why there's a, there's a human hair that is coming really tight. And then we have Russia, so close as, as you have also here. <laughs> I live in, in eastern Lapland and we have about 60 kilometers to the Russian border. There are many, um, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of confusion in the minds of people about Russia. They bring money to us with tourism, and yet we are we hate them and we are afraid of them. And then many people love them because many have married a Russian man or, or a Russian woman. In this case, I think it is a Russian woman because the house is gold and the, the style is so, so different. And I, I know the ones, the Russian ladies who live in Kemia, they're really nice and warm, I love, I love them. But, but you know, they, there are these tensions. And then this is called inheritance. Uh, the old man or, or a woman dies and leaves the inheritance to, to his children. Maybe there are two brothers or sisters trying to to work with the with the house, but they but they divide it and, and they begin to 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 fight about it and and everything that has grown there will die. <laughs> there are many houses that are left empty. They don't sell them. They don't rent them. They, they just fight over them, and the house is just rotten there. So that is that. But this one, this one is different. It is a house of a hunter. It is the only house that has a roof. <laughs> and it's a very nice roof. It's soft, it, it is uh, made of feathers of uh, uh, birds that people uh, eat there. So it is, a, it is a picture of a lifestyle that, that endures in this age. I mean, they are the, the humble ones, they are the silent ones, they, they hunt and they fish, they get um, food from the forest with a very low, very low income. And I think they are the kind of people that maybe Tolstoy would, <laughs> would lift very high. And there is this uh, a dream of industrialism that is a uh, the, the craziness of our city. We have a beautiful river, the lakes and the river, mm -hmm. the pure water, but they just want to have the factory to poison the water. <laughs> Look at that. That's, that's what it is. 
<laughs> it is a diamond, it is a jewel, it is a uh, something that I love. But so this this dream really kills the, the houses. It, it kills the uh, the heart. So that's why it pierces the, the house. And then there is this uh, <laughs> house of the wind. People who dream to do many sorts of things and uh, they never really are able to finish. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm there, <laughs> and uh, I usually paint with pastels, but as I know that it's so hard to 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 send paintings under the museum class, so. This is my acrylic, and uh, it is about something that you don't see the the, the soul, the bottom of, of things. You see a little bit, and uh, yeah, that's how it is. Obviously, a bit. Yeah. I think here we can conclude this. There is something to uh, think about that um, the relation with these uh, houses and the water, the water has these kind of uh, stones in this, it refers to the fluidity and the stream and these kind of barriers that are blocking yeah. this. Yeah? So this is something which is about the community, like a uh, certain kind of metaphor for, for uh, individual and social level and different proceedings in local context and global context, like with black energy and light energy in, in human life. And uh, as you have um, made these houses without roofs, or having these very explicit holes in them, so to me it seems that each of these houses is exposed to all these energies and tendencies around you, except the hunter. Yeah. <laughs> he has it right. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the artists of this exhibition and it was really, um, mm, uh, it was really uh, teaching. I learned a lot, uh, I still learn, and, uh, just to put together the exhibition, but, but to uh, learn from artworks. And each time it is different when we speak of the works and when we sell them. And I think that uh, for us as artists, this is also a, a situation where we learn. We learn who we are, that somebody kind of uh, gathers us and, and things that we do, that we, we ourselves, we see the bigger picture. And I wonder what Tartu people think. So we can discuss, continue talking, we can still eat the food. Upstairs <laughs> and make it. More hunters. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <thank you. laughs>